We've been talking about heaven and hell, and it's so many of you have been asking questions, and, and, and boy, I've been uncovering so much things and talking about so many things I recognize. We really need to do, do a series on the end times. So we're going to do that probably a little bit in July and August. We're going to be going into the end times. So uh, this schematic of what we're talking about, heaven and hell, fits within the end times, and it's good to understand how it all fits together. So we'll be discussing that, all right? Today, we're going to talk about heaven and hell just a little bit. And, uh, and remember, everybody, we only believe what the Bible has to say. That's our final authority, not what people tell us, not people's experiences. We can take those as footnotes, as interesting things we put on the side, but we must never base our life on someone's testimony. We must base our life on the testimony of the Scriptures. That's our final authority. And so there's been all kinds of things that have been said. So today we're going to look into that a little bit. And I I wanted to help us to understand how important it is. Like C.S. Lewis said it so well. He says, I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is I was made for another world. There's something inside of me that cries out, there must be more. This is not right. Something's not right. No other creature in all humanity even comes close to asking the question why we're here. A fish doesn't ask why it's wet in the ocean. And we ask ourselves why? Because he's put eternity in the human heart. And this earth is not all that it should be. Something is off. Something's off with the air. Something's off with the planet. There's something off with your DNA. There's something off with everything. Everything is off kilter, and there is a desire to make it right because sin came into the world. Sin simply means missing the mark. We chose to be prideful. The first sin in the Bible was pride. God, the enemy said, I will be like the most high God. And he was prideful. And pride comes before the fall. It's very interesting that there's a lot of talk about pride these days. And I think we need to be more humble than prideful, including in the church. Including in the church. We don't walk around like we know it all. We're just very humble that God has given us an opportunity to make a difference. Amen? So this is all part of the process. Now, in order to understand everything, what you believe about eternity affects how you live your life now. If you don't think... You're going to have to give an account for your life. And all that's going to happen is you're going to be like one of those mosquitoes on your porch at night that fly towards the light. (laughs) Can I hear an amen for killing mosquitoes? (laughs) I used to be afraid of bats until I learned as a child that bats eat mosquitoes. That's when I began to like Batman. So, but we're not going to just zap. There actually is an afterlife that happens after this life. That's why they call it the... Isn't that brilliant? So there is an afterlife. What happens? And we talked a little bit last week about it. Today, we're going to look at it today. So how you face your life. If you don't think you're going to have to give an account for how you live your life, you don't care what happens. And you can see the consequences there within our culture today where people don't think it matters. I don't like this life, so I'm going to take other people with me as I end my life in a horrific set of events that I'm going to do because I don't believe there's a heaven anyhow, and I'm never going to be judged anyhow. But when you realize there is judgment that one day you're going to have to pay and you're going to have to give an account for your life. And if you don't like it, then you need to change the way you look at people and stop judging people because there's justice in every one of our hearts. When we see something that's inhumane, when we see something bad, when you see children abused, the elderly abused, the innocent abused, something rises up. That's not right, right? Why? Because you have the justice of God inside of you. There's love, and really, without justice, there's no love. If someone comes into my house and robs my house, and, and I sit there and do nothing, I'm not showing love, I'm showing cowardness. I want to protect. Love protects. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love is not some feeling. Love is a decision to think of others more than yourself. And ultimately, love is God. That's true love. And so what you believe on eternity affects how you live your life now. And this is why we have to look beyond this life. There's more than this, this life. And if you look at this life only and think of this life only, you're going to miss the point. And today we're going to take a few moments to look about what it means. In Hebrews 11:6, 6, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible, talks about faith. And in the chapter 11 of, uh, I know how many like chapter 11. It's a good thing to happen, especially during tax day. 
No, chapter 11 of Hebrews is an amazing book of the Bible. We call it the Hall of Faith. Uh, my family and I went to a place called Cooperstown in New York. What a great place. And you're driving through this farmland. And all of a sudden, you come to the cutest little town. And in the, in the town, they had the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I tell you, it's awesome. You walked in the Hall of Fame, and you see Babe Ruth. And I mean, he's not there, but his, his plaque is there. They do have a statue of Babe Ruth, by the way. And so I, you know, I put flowers down, I put incense, I began to worship it, put some fruit. It was fantastic. No, I did not do that. Lord knows we could use Babe Ruth right now if the Yankees are kind of falling apart, but we'll move on. But in the Hall of Fame, what happens? We celebrate what they've done. Wow, look what they've done. But there's a Hall of Fame in, in heaven, but the difference is they're not just plaques on a wall. There are witnesses, people that have gone through this life, lived with God, and came to the other side, people that screwed up royally and God calls them victorious and they are in heaven as heroes even though they messed up on earth because God forgave them and they are witnesses they're witnesses that we can look at examples we can look at how we can live our lives and the Bible gives inferences that we have a great cloud of witnesses looking down upon us encouraging us but we don't pray to this cloud of witnesses because nowhere in the Bible does it ever tell you to pray to Aunt Martha in South Dakota no, the Bible never tells us to pray to anyone but Jesus. He's our only one mediator. But there is a great cloud of witnesses. And we must believe, right, without faith it's impossible to please him, for we must believe he exists, and God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So this is the context, diligently seek him, and then we see here where now we get to Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, where it says this, but now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He's talking about Abraham, talking about Gideon, talking about even Rahab the harlot is mentioned in it. A prostitute is mentioned in the lineage of the Hall of Fame. Hello. That's amazing. Because she gave her life to God. So no matter where you are, if you're a king or you're a messed up, God can redeem you. Now what's so amazing is that they are looking to a better place, right? They have a better country that we don't just live in. We, we have a citizenship of heaven. We have a visa on earth and the embassy of heaven. We have embassies all through the state of Connecticut. And I believe embassies are like churches, we're a little heaven. We gather together in this place and recognize that this is not our home. Heaven is. So it's so important. They desire a better place, a heavenly country. Now, we come to Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And the word surrounding, does, it means surrounded. It doesn't mean they're off in a far off place. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that your parents are hovering over you like a, no, we're not suggesting that. But the veil between this life and the next is a lot thinner than you think. Now, the next life is not bound by, by, by time and space like we are here. We're controlled by the, by the time sequence we have right here. But in heaven, there's a whole different measure of time that's not different than that's different than here the bible says a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years the bible says that this life is like a blink of an eye and i personally believe that god sees what's happening and and for him it's not so long as we think it is here but this great cloud of witnesses, you can see inferences in the Bible. For example, you can see in Mount Transfiguration when Jesus was in his earthly ministry, he took uh, Peter, James, and John with him. He went to an uh, upper place. And when he did, the, the Bible says that Elijah and Moses appeared with Jesus. Well, how did they know it was them? They recognized them. And so we're going to get into that in a few minutes, which is that when you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that. So we know there's a great cloud of witnesses. They were watching what's going on because they're, they're the great witnesses. They, they played their part. And now they're watching the fulfillment of everything they set up for, even though they didn't understand the significance, it, significance of it when they were on earth. Then later on, it says in the book of Revelation that the martyrs crawled to God, how long, how long, oh God, will you wait? So they're watching. Do you watching you all the time? I don't know. 
But there is enough inference in heaven that we have a great cloud of witnesses. Why? Because there is a plan of God that's a lot bigger than your plan and my plan. Please understand this. We, if you live for this life only, you're going to miss the point. You may not know why God has you here. Remember, in wartime, during World War II, there was a war room where Eisenhower, the president, the president was there, not Eisenhower, I'm sorry, uh, the president was there and, and, and all the people were there and they were strategizing, right? Roosevelt, they were strategizing what's going to happen in the war and they tell the military commanders what to do. The military commanders did only have the ideas of their mission. They didn't understand the full scope of what was going to happen. Same with us. We don't understand the full scope of what God is doing. All we know, God tells us to do various things. He goes, scroll, spread the gospel. And you may not realize this, but maybe your life, maybe the whole purpose of you coming to this planet is to have a child or to share your faith with somebody that brings the link to somebody else. You don't know the difference your life is going to make. We are on a chain. We're like links in a chain. And right now, we have the link we're in right now connected to the previous link, connected to the forward link. That's why it's important in the next generation. So God's purposes are not just for our life. There is a grand purpose, and we have to be obedient to that. And in the responsibility that God has given us, he's given us things to do in our, in our time as well. And we'll be judged upon that. I hope you understand that. we got to look beyond our own personal life and the temporary place. I know in Europe and other parts of the world, they have a better understanding of multi-generations. When I was in Malaysia, I was talking to some Muslim people, and they, they mentioned the Crusades. They remember all the stuff that took place in the Middle Ages. They, they talk about it. We, we forget about stuff, right? We build a mall, and in 20 years, we knock it down and put something else up. We, we don't have the concept of multi-generations as they do in Europe and even some Middle East countries, such as Israel, where you have buildings that are two, 3,000 years old. There's a better concept of that we are just one part of a story. In America, it's all about us, right? I'm, I'm the central character. You're all, you're all cast members. <laughs> That's how we live our lives, right? That's not the way it is. We're in a part together. All right? So we have a great cloud of witnesses. So we're to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one, right? And I mention this so much, a very important verse of the Bible, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Folks, this life gets tough. Sometimes this life makes zero sense. I'm, I'm speaking to some of you right now, even in this room, and I, I, I can't give you the only answer I can give you that God is good. It's going to work. I don't know how it's going to work out, but in this life, you're going to have trouble. And the Bible's very, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross because he looked beyond this earth. The only way you and I can get through this earth is look beyond this earth. This is not all there is. If this is all there is, as the Apostle Paul says, we are a pitiful people. But we are looking to a higher place. We're looking to another country. And that we are in process. And I'm going to explain this to you when we go of our, our end time series. We're going to explain the whole history of how it all falls together. And when is that? No, in August. next week is Israel. Okay. We've got to keep teasing you guys and keep the, keep the tight. No, okay, I'm just kidding. Marketing 101. Okay. So he endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, that's Jesus, who endured such hostility... From sinners against himself, lest you become, what? Weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been weary and discouraged in my soul. The reason why the apostle Paul said, lest you become weary and discouraged, because he got weary and discouraged. He says, pressed down, but not destroyed. Struck down, but not destroyed, right? We go through troubles. This is not heaven. And the reason why we're longing for something else, because there's something else. This is not our home. If you're going on a vacation and you're going to wherever, let's suppose you're going to California or something, you go to Sequoias and see the trees or go to um, Yosemite or something, and you're driving and you stop at a rest stop. Do you, okay, praise God, we're at the rest stop. We stop, then we, just, we, 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 get a, we get a machete and we put up a tent and we build a house on the rest stop. You don't do that at a rest stop. A rest stop is a what? You guys are so smart. It's a rest stop, Okay. This earth is not our final home. It's a rest stop as we're on a journey to heaven. Okay? And so there's more to this life than this. 
So for consider him who endured such hostility to sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So let me go ahead and give you a little bit of understanding about heaven and how it works a little bit. I had a friend of mine, again, this is a, this is a story that kind of illustrates something. It's not scripture, but it's going to help you understand. I think it does to a certain degree. I had a friend of mine, his name is Rick. He was driving a motorcycle about 30 years ago. And I uh, was not a believer at the time. I think he was, actually, he was a believer at the time. And he got in an accident, and he flew over his handlebars. He hit the car, landed on the pavement, and he pretty much flatlined for a little bit. And they had to bring him back. And the amazing part is, he remembers what happened. He said when he died, he actually saw like a, like a hovering view, like a drone footage or a helicopter footage, and he explained to the police and others what was going on, and he described it to a T. And there's no way he would have been able to know where the cars were, the houses were. He, saw, he, he felt himself leave his body and come back. There's a dear friend of mine, and I don't have permission to share right now, that uh, passed away this past year. And uh, he came back. It was a miracle. We prayed hard. He came back. And everyone keeps asking him, what did you see? What did you see? He keeps saying nothing. And I keep telling him, let's make up a story and go on tour. <laughs> I, want, I, want to be on, I want to go on tour, write a book, make movie rights. We'll be millionaires. But he didn't experience that, right? But it, these stories are fine. I went to heaven and came back and these movies and books. That's fine. Don't get sidetracked with these types of things. They're footnotes. They're all, uh -huh, how interesting. But our final authority is scripture, not someone's experience. But there is enough evidence to show that when we leave this body, we do leave. And we are conscious. And we can see that in heaven, which we're going to get into in a few moments, what happens in paradise is that we're going to get to in a few moments, but we do see what's going on. We're recognizable by other people, but we don't have our glorified bodies yet. But we're not some misty thing playing harps in heaven. Okay? And by the way, heaven is going to be amazing one day. We'll get into it again in a few moments. But the Bible says, for it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him both in this earth and the earth to come. Now, if I had the capacity to do this, imagine for a moment, we have a bunch of pregnant people in this church, praise God. Babies keep coming. We love babies. So if they cry, it's okay. Just don't let me watch them too long. So all kidding aside, imagine, if you will, we could talk to a nine-month-old nine baby in its mother's room before it came out, about two weeks before. And the baby's complaining. It's getting a little cramped in here, okay? And imagine this baby had a capacity to be very intelligent like you are, okay? And we had a communication device, not FaceTime, but we had just, you know, audio. And you're trying to explain to this baby what it's like in Cancun, Mexico, or what it's like on the beach, on a Caribbean beach. You're trying to describe how the aqua water is in the, in the breeze and, and the sand and the, and the birds and the wildlife and the dolphins that are swimming out there. And you're trying to explain to this baby that's in its mother's womb. This, this baby has, can't, all the baby did is it sees light, it hears faint sounds. And by the way, a baby can recognize its mother's or father's voice. And sometimes it can see light going through the womb. And so now you're trying to explain and say, hey, what's going on out there? It's getting kind of cramped in here. What's on the other side of this? Okay, you're trying to describe to this baby what's on the other side. The only way you can describe to the baby what's on the other side is you have to find common ground in order to bring that baby to new ground. You gotta find common ground intellectually and conversationally in order for to explain. So you say, well, you know that warm feeling you have right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico is kind of like that. It, it's beautiful, and, and it's aqua blue. Uh, you know that nice feeling you have when you hear that nice voice and you hear your mother's voice? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. You know that nice feeling? That's what it feels like if we were in the sun. So you're trying to describe to this baby the Caribbean or what it's like on a beautiful beach, and the, child has, the baby has no concept of it. All it can do is take the surrounding processes it has and find some, some correspondence of, between the two. You follow me, everybody? Okay. When the Bible talks about heaven, it's like that. We just, we don't even have an idea what it's like. And I know people say to me, oh, I, I hope I get married before I go to heaven so I can have relationships that are very pleasant. 
I hope I, hope I can, before I go to heaven, I hope I can retire. I hope, before I go to heaven, I hope I do this. Guys, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's so much better on the other side that nothing here even comes close. It's like a baby in its mother's womb. It's so much better. And so what does that mean? Well, no eye has seen it. And I want to encourage you with that today because God has something great for us. Even the Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, I know a man who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. There's three heavens, if you will. The first heaven would be the clouds above us. The second heaven would be the stars, right? And then the third heaven would be this spiritual realm where God is. So the Apostle Paul apparently was caught up, whether in the body or in the body, I do not know. God knows. But, he says, this man was caught up into paradise. Remember we said to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Lord. Jesus told the man on the cross who gave his life to Christ at that very moment. Today you'll be with me in? He didn't say you'll go into soul sleep. The Bible says it's appointed for a man to die once, then comes the what? Judgment. Okay, there's no, the final exam is this life. Very clear. Be absent from the body, present with the Lord. So, God knows, and I know this man was caught up into paradise. The Apostle Paul, apparently, one time, by the way, he was preaching the gospel, and these people began to worship him like he was a god. He tore his clothes and said, I'm not a god, I'm just an ordinary man. About four or five verses later, they end up stoning the Apostle Paul, left him for dead. Very interesting. People would rather worship a ministry and a minister and uh, something they can see than worship Jesus Christ. So you'll be less popular if you point to Jesus, but you'll be popular in heaven. Because people want idols. And the only idol we're going to have is Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. We're not the only church. I'm not the only pastor. There's a lot of great churches out there, a lot of great pastors. Okay, it isn't about that. It's about Jesus, him crucified. And that's what it's all about. And so when Paul did it, he, got, he got, literally got stoned. People say, at least he got some relief. No, 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 that's not what happened. He literally got stoned and was left for dead. And the church gathered around him and they prayed and he came back to life, according to the scriptures. So it could be very well that he had a, a trip to heaven. I don't know. I, I, I have heard and I have read that when you are in that state, it's like it's out of time. It's like it could be an hour, it could be two minutes. Again, these are all like sidebars we don't make doctrine out of this, everybody. Our doctrine and our belief system comes from the Bible, not these other things. Is that clear? But it's interesting to talk about and interesting to see that that indeed is the truth. He goes, whether in the body or not, not I do not know. God knows. And he, he heard things that cannot be told, which many do not utter. So the Bible says, yes, we're fully confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for when we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him, whether we're in heaven or on earth. And by the way, when you go to, when you go to heaven one day, the new heavens, the new earth, we're going to have jobs. They're not going to be boring. And they're gonna, you're going to have a challenge, but it's going to be a good challenge. You're going to be part of the creative process. You want to know what it's like? Look what mankind did before the fall. The Bible says that God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would name them. So naming is part of the creative process. I believe God is going to give us raw material. Look about, look, right now, God gave us this planet. We took wood, sand, oil, uh, rock, right, and water, and we made this building. Raw materials. Why? Because God gave us creativity. And so for eternity, we're going to be being very creative. We'll be doing wonderful things with God. We're co-heirs with Christ. Amazing. So there's a lot more we could say about that. But we'll be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here or on earth, we want to please him. For we, must, for we all must stand before Christ to be what? Judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we've done on this earthly boat. Some will go to heaven and some will go to a place called hell. The Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoa. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I don't like that very much. What about the sweet Jesus we keep hearing about? You see, the gospel is good news because there is indeed bad news. We have a place called heaven and hell. Now, I want to just review for a few moments about that, about a parable that Jesus talks about, actually a story that illustrates what it's like. 
And to save a little time, let me go tell you what happens. There was this man by the name of Lazarus who was poor, who used to be at the rich man's table, just one of the crumbs from it. He eventually died and went to Abraham's bosom, which represents paradise, the pla- or Sheol, the place of holding. And then the rich man dies, and he goes to a place called Hades. And there's a gulf between them. And the, the, um, the rich man sees, uh, sees Lazarus, and he is in Abraham's bosom. He is enjoying things. He's in paradise. And here you have Lazarus in hell, who's basically saying, would you please le- tell Lazarus to come down here and tip the finger in my mouth with a little bit of water, which is so amazing is that the audacity of this rich man to think he can still control Lazarus. So what happens is there's a great gulf in between. And he goes, please, I want you to tell my brothers that they don't come to this place. And and, and Abraham goes, listen, they had Moses and the prophets. If they won't listen to that, they won't even listen to someone who rises from the dead. You see, if people don't respond to the truth they see in the scriptures and they see in nature, they're not going to respond to Jesus even if he rises from the dead. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 1, although they knew God, they denied God. And even with... What's obvious about God is about them through the creation. But their foolish hearts became darkened, right? Because it's obvious. And so people don't run to the light. They run from the light. So what happens in this passage of Scripture, we see that. Now, what happens is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, before Jesus came, there was a place called Sheol, and you had, you had Hades and Abraham's bosom. When Jesus died on the cross, it says he descended into hell. And apparently he went down here and he released those that were waiting, the, the people that were waiting in faith, and they followed Jesus and they went to paradise up here. They're in a place called paradise. And we're going to stay in paradise until the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ, the dead, the, the dead bodies will rise up and they will be reconstituted with new bodies. And then whether there's a millennium or not, we don't know exactly when that is. We'll get into that in August. Okay. Then we have the great right throne of judgment. Then we have a new heavens and new earth. We're with God forever on earth and heaven. And then there's a place called the lake of fire. Okay, everybody. But right now, this is the county jail. And this is the resort center until Christ comes back. In the resort center, apparently, you can recognize people. You can see. You're, you're, you're having an amazing time with God up there. It's very clear. We can see that in scripture. Again, we want to see what it's like. We saw what, uh, we saw what happened with uh, Elijah and also with Elijah, I mean, not Elisha, Elijah and Moses, right? We see what took place. We know right now, according to the book of Revelation, they're saying, how long do we have to wait? So they are watching us down here right now, but they're in a place of heaven. And one day when you die, you'll be with Christ. It's going to be an amazing thing. You will not be in a white room. And they're not going to be having a worship service all day long. Sit down, get up, sit down, get up. Praise God, reading scripture all day. That's not, it's not going to be that. It's going to be amazing. Like that baby, okay? You guys got me? But this place of hell, it's also a place of torment. And so there's characteristics I want to bring to your attention about this. And what we can see in the scriptures, why, what's the reasons for hell's existence? One is hell exists for God to justify, justly punish Satan. That's the reason why. And heaven exists to be with God forever and a reward righteousness, reward righteousness. So what happens is hell is made for the enemy. And when you and I say, I don't, wanna, I don't want God, if you and I say, I don't want God, God says, have it your way. Because we want to be our own gods. There's a problem when you want to be your own God. You and I are lousy gods. You ever hear of the statement, absolute power corrupts absolutely? It does. You and I can't handle the power. You and I need a savior. You're designed to be in concert with God. You're designed to submit to God, to work with God. And that's where you find your true fulfillment and God will give rewards to each of us. Some of us will will be over many things. Some of us will be over nothing. I'm telling you that this is a job interview. And there's a lot more we're going to share in August. You better be in church in August. You're going to miss out, everybody. Okay. And so what happens in the book of Revelation? And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they will be tormented day and night forever. There are different levels of hell. 
apparently, in Scripture. Jesus says, you'll be punished more. So I don't understand the whole system, but guys, I don't want to go there. I don't know what it's like. I don't, know what, I don't want to know what it's like. I want to stay close to Jesus. I want to be with him in paradise, right? Oh, listen, everybody, you see the suffering going on right now in the world? Do you see the horrific things that are taking place? You see the abuse of people? You see the wickedness taking place, people killing people? You see all the suffering going on right now in Haiti? You see what's going on even in the Gaza Strip and other places where people are suffering? Now, this is not a political statement. There, there's war going on. There's craziness going on, okay? And no matter what you like it or not, and there's suffering. You see the wickedness going on. Why is this happening? Because people saying, I want to do it my way, not God's way. And you see the devastation. There's a cancer called pride. And pride is, I'm God. And it leads us to destruction because we can't be God. We can't be God. So this is what begins to happen. And God will wipe, here's a, here's a contrast. That's hell, here's heaven. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, praise God, no more sorrow, no more crying, in, including babies, okay? There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Praise the Lord. I keep my eyes on where I am going. What are some lessons in the afterlife Is the, in the opposite joys of heaven? We have full awareness in hell versus full joy in heaven. We can see it in the parable. You can see it in the story that Jesus talked about. Also, hell, the rich man was fully conscious and aware of his torment. In heaven, believers will be fully aware and filled with joy in God's presence. And the man in hell said, please, have, let, let Lazarus go back and tell my brothers. Guys, I don't want to get to heaven one day and I feel like I, I never told my neighbor. I never told my next door neighbor. I never told my brother. I never told my sister. I was ashamed of it. I don't want blood on my hands. And for me not to talk about hell would be malpractice. I have to talk about hell. And I know it's not popular to talk about. But one day you're going to stand before God. Are you ready to meet God? And the only way can be, I'm not ready to meet God without Jesus. Do you follow me, everybody? Very important we understand that. So this is what's going to happen in those both places according to what we looked at. So, there's a fixed eternal destiny in hell versus an eternal security in heaven. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not heaven, not hell, not angels or demons. Nothing's able to separate us from, heaven, from, from God. That's a beautiful thing in Christ Jesus. And so we'll be fixed in heaven. No more pain. No more struggling. No more like, you know, ever, ever have trouble with self-discipline? No more problem. In heaven, you can have as many donors as you want. I'm convinced there's going to be meat plants in heaven. We're not to kill any animals. They're going to have grit. Okay. I hope there's meat in heaven, but I hope it's not from animals. Of course not. Okay. We fall, fall, fix eternal destiny. I start a new religion. I like that. Meat plants. Although they're starting to grow meat in laboratories. It's kind of weird. Recognizing of just suffering in hell versus recognizing of just rewards in heaven. The man knew what he did was wrong. Guys, you ever mess up? You're like, oh, man, I want to get it right. Imagine having that forever. Imagine regrets forever. You know, it's so beautiful. I make a lot of mistakes. I can go to God. God, forgive me. And God forgives me. Then I have to go to my brother or my sister and say, would you please forgive me? And we reconcile. Can you imagine having unresolved conflict for the rest of your life? What are what people saying? Well, I'm married to one. No, yeah, that's part of the problem. You need to be humble. And you need to be the change you want to see in your marriage. Stop waiting for your spouse to change. Desperate pleas to save others from hell versus eternal fellowship with others in heaven. I'm going to see my grandparents. I'm going to see my mom. In fact, the Bible says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And I will tell you right now that I'm beginning to move stuff to the other side already. Part of my heart's been shipped to heaven when my grandparents passed away. A big container was left my life in my heart when my mother went. I'm not saying I'm gonna die now, but I'm ready to die right now if I need to. I prepared myself. I have life insurance for my family. I'm, I'm, just, being, I'm just being honest with you. But I wanna be here. I wanna make a difference. But I'm not afraid to die. I'm not. I know to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. However, I'm torn between the two, to be honest with you at times. 
Sometimes I'm like, God, I had enough. Am I the only one? When I see what's going on in our country and our world, but I'm like, God, you had me here for a reason. And Father, thank you for the joy of my salvation that I can endure what's going on here. I'm not being negative. I'm being, real, being realistic. I'm looking for the joy set before him. I don't want to go yet because I've got so much more to do. And I want to get a good reward. I've got much more to do first, right? I want to have a bigger house than you. I'm just kidding. Sort of. Okay. We all heard John 3.16, right? It used to be, T it's not Tim Tebow. It's actually John 3.16. And John 3.16, I can quote it. Most of you can probably quote it. If you can't, I'll just go ahead and say you. For God so loved the world, agape the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we stop right there. But do you realize there's a John 17, 3.6.17, and a 3.18. Now, 317 is nice, too. It says, for I did not come to condemn the world, but I came to save the world. And I want to let you know something. The fact that you're alive means God loves you, has a purpose for your life, or you would not be here. And then there's John 3, 18. And 3, 18 and 19 says the following. He who believes in him is not condemned. Believes means accepts, not just believes intellectually. It means accepts him as their Lord and Savior. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned because we have a death sentence on us. And believing in Christ and accepting Christ gets it off of ourselves. Because he has no, because he has not believed in the name of the Lord only, begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Don't you tell me what to do. This is my life. I'm going to redefine my life based upon what I want. I'm not going to forget that person. I'm going to do this or the other, right? This is my life. And I don't care what your light says. When you turn the lights on in the middle of the night, of course, no, no, one, no one's house. This is your neighbor's house or somebody else's house. You put a Lights on in the middle of the night, and there's roaches. What do they do? They run from the light. The mice run from the light. That's your neighbor's house, not yours. People are afraid of the light. Why? They don't want to be exposed. Guys, we should run to the light and say, Father, I'm a mess. I need the message of Jesus to change me. Accept the message and let your mess become your message of forgiveness and grace. That's what God has for us. He doesn't want to leave you in a mess. He doesn't want to leave you in a place called hell. That's why Jesus came, to make a difference. And the Bible is very clear about this. They ran because their deeds were evil. My question to you today is, if you were to die today, do you absolutely, positively know you'd be with God in heaven? That's the most important thing, that you come to know God. I believe in God, yeah, but are you full of pride? Pride is, I'm doing it my way. We need to have a month of humility, a year of humility, where we say, you know what? It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. I'm not prideful. Yes, I am. The fact that you say you're not prideful is you're prideful. Do you know the, that there was a boy that one time won an award for being, for being, um, being humble, and he lost it by wearing it? Pride destroys us. What God asks us to do is simple this. You must believe he exists, he rose again from the dead, forgave you of your sins, and then you have to be willing to say, Lord, I surrender to you. You're God, and I'm not. I'm going to bow. I'm going to let go of pride, and I'm going to be humble before you. The Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will raise you up. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the what? Humble. You and I have to be willing to lay down our lives. Not my will, but your will be done. That's what Jesus said. Now, that's for salvation. Now, what about the rest of us? I, I want to encourage all the rest of us to begin to focus on heaven, to recognize everything you do, you're going to have to get an account for. And the only assurance you have is living in the light of Jesus and surrendering your life to Jesus and letting this blood wash you clean on a daily basis and staying in the right concept with God that one day you'll see him and not be ashamed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's going to reward you based on what you've done and there are rewards in heaven. 
This is a big job interview. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute.